something here. <clears throat> Waiting for the stream to fire up on all the different cylinders. If you're not a regular of the program, we do multi-stream on Periscope, on Facebook, and on YouTube. And it looks like all of the streams are now live. Hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Watching the Watchers Live. My name is Robert Gruler. I am a criminal defense attorney here in Scottsdale, Arizona. Watching the Watchers is a show that we do here to monitor police misconduct, prosecutorial misconduct, judicial misconduct, political misconduct, all of the different types of misconduct that exist in our criminal justice system. We want to talk about it, call it out, and hold those responsible for it accountable. Over the course of our time representing many thousands of people in the criminal justice system, we've seen a lot of this type of malfeasance. And unfortunately, there are a lot of bad guys in our criminal justice system, but they're masquerading as the good guys. They're hiding behind a gun and a badge, and they are operating in a different tier and a different level of justice. You or I would get prosecuted, we would go to jail, we would have the book thrown at us, but these people who are in a different echelon, they have a different set of rules that they follow. Now today, it's kind of been a weird news day, so uh, everything is just right now, it's all focused on Donald Trump having the coronavirus. Literally, as we were, as I just hit the live button, we know that Donald Trump was just leaving Walter Reed Medical Center. So here is on Twitter, President Trump returns to the White House from the Walter Reed Medical Center. He, he announced earlier today that he was going to be leaving today, this afternoon. Dr. Sean Conley said the White House physician said Trump is not entirely out of the woods yet, but he's able to return to the White House. He's going to receive another dose of remdesivir before leaving, which is the, that antiviral that has had a lot of success. Uh, my family was on that when they were in the hospital, and they both pulled through. So it's looking pretty good for Donald Trump. It's looking like he's going to beat this thing. He's going to be back at the White House, and that is good news. I think everybody should be happy about that. Donald Trump, whether you like him or not, whether you like his policies or not, that is our president. That is the United States president, and we want that person whomever it is, to be succeed, is to be healthy and succeed because their success is intricately tied to our success. If they're successful, then the country is successful, and that's what we want. So it was a weird day doing show prep today because everything was so focused on this. Literally everywhere I looked on Twitter, on all the different news sites, everybody was talking about Donald Trump and the coronavirus, which is, I think, appropriate given that it is a huge deal but we're hopeful that maybe we can now talk about some other things now that he's gone through this uh you know the media is hysterical over this anybody who's been connected to COVID or been been you know kind of hysterical about COVID is in hyperdrive today everybody's you know throwing around these terms like is this a hoax is was he faking this thing you know is he really sick with the coronavirus and kind of a lot of silliness going on in, as far as I can tell Pretty clear that he was sick, pretty clear from his videos, his, his voice was hoarse. Don't think there's really much to talk about there. But there was some other things that happened around the world. And so we're going to leave the Trump COVID stuff. We're going to leave that behind and we are going to move on. Today, we uh, have some stories. We have a new indication that there may be a new shooting, a new officer involved shooting. This was coming out over the weekend and I wanted to just flag it right now. We are still waiting for a lot of information to come out over this thing. Uh, but it's looking like there was a new shooting that took place took place in Texas involving this gentleman. His name is Jonathan Price. And this story comes from the Herald Banner. Jonathan Price was trying to intervene in a domestic violence situation inside of a gas station. The man was fighting with another woman who assaulted Price, who's that guy. And then when the officers arrived, it sounds like they tased him and then they shot him. So he is now uh, no longer with us. We were trying to figure out what was going on with this thing. Uh, a couple stories were trickling out. One from the WFAA.com uh, said that the Texas Rangers are investigating a police shooting that took place in Wolf City and that that officer had been placed on leave. Doesn't indicate that there's any malfeasance or anything there. Anytime an officer is involved in a shooting or a use of force situation, they are almost always placed on leave just because of the uh, intensity surrounding the circumstances. So we're going to continue to follow this one along. I'm not real sure. Uh, you know how this one is going to was going to come out, but we do see some posts from some people on Facebook indicating that this may be yet another shooting where the cops were a little bit too quick to draw. Now again, this is all this is all new. It's all coming out quick. So this was posted by Lee Merritt. His uh, this was on Facebook. He said his name was Jonathan Price in Wolf City, Texas. He was known as a hometown hero, motivational speaker, trainer, professional athlete, community advocate. 
clearly dearly loved by so many. He noticed a man assaulting a woman. He intervened. When the woman, when the police arrived, I'm told he raised his hands and attempted to explain what was going on. Police fired tasers at him. When his body convulsed from the electrical current, they perceived a threat, in quotes, and then shot him to death. Here's a link to his family. Of course, they're trying to raise money. I've spoken to the family, and they've agreed to do whatever it takes. So this guy, uh, this Lee Merritt, my understanding is he is the family attorney. He's a civil rights attorney for the family, and then he posted that picture up on Facebook. So, you know, we're going to continue to follow that story. Just wanted to flag it. I was under the impression that the police were going to release a statement today. But as we were preparing, excuse me, for the show, we were not able to find anything. So we're going to continue to follow this. We're going to see if there's more stuff that comes out. But uh, that is yet another one that we saw crop up over the weekend. So uh, hit the subscribe button if you've not already done so. We'll follow that and many others as we continue on. What I really want to do is kind of dig into the Supreme Court. A lot of Supreme Court today, if that's boring to you, I apologize, but there's a a situation that's developing right now where it's very illustrative. I want to show you sort of what's at stake in the Supreme Court because today was the beginning of a new term. The Supreme Court had a new term started today on Monday, and it's going to run through October and November. We're going to have a lot of court proceedings that take place in the Supreme Court, and I'm not even talking about the nomination. We're not talking about Amy Coney Barrett. We're not talking about any of the confirmation hearings or any of the political hoopla that we are going to be experiencing starting on October 12th, just seven days from now, according to Lindsey Graham. So that's not what we're talking about. This is regular, ordinary Supreme Court business. And because the court right now is sitting in a position where it's really eight judges, it's only eight judges, we could have a lot of or several cases where we have a 4-4 split, where there's a deadlock at the Supreme Court until we get the new justice appointed, whomever that may be. It could be Amy Coney Barrett, If the Republicans are successful, if the Democrats are successful in stalling this ordeal, then we may have a different judge altogether. But right now, it's four to four. We've got a potential for a deadlock in the Supreme Court. And the new term started today. So there were oral arguments on a couple cases, nothing really pertinent to criminal law or relevant to watching the watchers, but it has started and there are some cases on the docket that will be coming down the pike. So today, Judge Roberts, who is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, started the term by paying homage to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. He said that she was a dear friend, a treasured colleague, and he said that uh, that basically, you know, he, he gave her some accolades for her long history there and was very appreciative of everything that she contributed. The justices today are beginning a new term, and here is what an article from actually Al Jazeera says. They're, they're on the cusp of realizing a dream of 50 years in the making, a solid conservative majority that might roll back, and this is their quote, abortion rights, expand gun rights, and shrink the power of the government. It is the most unusual, politically fraught moment in U.S. history, according to this article. The justices are still mourning the death of Ginsburg, the leader of the court's liberal wing. They are working in the midst of a pandemic that has forced the court to drastically change the way it conducts business in the presidential election is less than a month away. So we are dealing with a court that is in a little bit of turmoil right now because it's missing that ninth vote. When it's a four to four vote, the court really is just at a deadlock. Those cases are not really decided. There's no binding legal precedent that comes out of those cases. And so any of those cases that are in the pipeline, which are thousands and thousands of cases that are all trickling up and bubbling up to the Supreme Court until there's a new judge seated on there, there's a potential that there is no resolved issues there. It would be like having the Supreme or it would be like it would be like having like mostly a president, but somebody who was there who was missing, uh, who couldn't do most things because they couldn't break a deadlock. It would be a big problem. And we're starting to see some indications that there may be some more shifts coming through the court. So, you know, when every time we have a, a change in the judge, what, on the Supreme Court, what typically happens, we have seen historically, or at least in, in my lifetime, now this has gone back you know, significantly longer than I've been alive, but in our lifetime, the judges who've been replaced have traditionally replaced the judges on the same side, right? So Anthony Kennedy stepped down, that was, he was replaced by Kavanaugh. Okay, so Kavanaugh, Kennedy was appointed by Reagan, also a conservative judge, was, was a, a, replaced by Kavanaugh, who's also a conservative judge. When Scalia died, Scalia was replaced by Gorsuch, a Trump appointee. Scalia was a right-wing judge on the right side of the court, Gorsuch on the right side of the court. Today, though, what we're talking about is Justice Ginsburg, who was on the left side of the court, being replaced by Amy Coney Barrett, who's going to be on the right side of the court. 
big deal. It's going to tip the balance of power. And we're starting to see some indication that the Supreme Court may be setting up some future decisions. So this was posted today. Let me explain how cases make it to the Supreme Court. There are a couple ways that it can happen. Traditionally, uh, you, you, you can't just appeal a case to, a, to the Supreme Court. So let's say, for example, you're just an everyday citizen like you or I, and I go out, have a good night. I have uh, you know one too many to drink. I have a DUI conviction. I lose my DUI case at trial. And I say, I'm going to appeal this thing all the way up to the Supreme Court. I think that there was something pretty catastrophic that happened. The cops really falsified data or they suppressed something. They should, you know, something, something bad happened in the case and I want to appeal it. Can I take my case directly to the Supreme Court? The answer is really no. Uh, there's, there's no mechanism to do that. What you would need to do is appeal it in your state court. So you would need to go to a superior court, then do an appeals court. Then you've got several circuit court of appeals within your state. Then you have a state Supreme Court. Then you could theoretically appeal that, that decision up to the Supreme Court. Or if the states are suing one another, like California sues Arizona over water rights, that can go to the Supreme Court. There are other ways you can do it, but one of the ways is by just going directly to the Supreme Court and asking them to grant you what's called a writ of certiorari. We call it a writ because certiorari is a terrible word to have to say over and over again, but what that means is that you're asking the court for permission for them to hear your case. You're saying, look, we have this novel issue. We need you to hear about it. We Please take our case. Please accept our case. And the Supreme Court can say, nope, we've already decided that, or, or we're not going to decide it. So this happens sometimes when there's a split between the federal courts of appeals. Let's say we have a, a split where the Seventh Circuit, which is where Amy Coney Barrett is seated, she says that gun rights should uh, also apply to felons. You know, they should have gun rights. That's what we covered in one of her opinions previously on this show. She says that's okay. Now, that's not the law in the Seventh Circuit. This is just a hypothetical. But let's say that that is the law in the Seventh Circuit. And we go over to the Ninth Circuit, which is over in California on the West Coast. And they have a different interpretation of that. So they say no gun rights. Amy Coney Barrett, the Seventh Circuit says yes, gun rights. We have a split. So California is doing things one way, but in Indiana, Ohio, and uh, Illinois, they're doing things an, a different way. So now the Supreme Court would rectify that. It would say it would listen to you know both arguments and uh, come to a, an agreement and say this is the law for the whole country. Everybody get on board. But there are situations where the Supreme Court says. We're not going to hear that case. We've already heard that. So you guys may have a disagreement, but work it out amongst yourself. So they can deny that writ. So if somebody comes and appeals that, they can say, we've already covered that. Uh, look to our other case law. We're not going to decide that. So in this case, today, literally, we had a, case, a situation where a, a lawsuit was brought or a claim was brought before the Supreme Court. They filed an appeal up to the Supreme Court, and the court said, we don't want to hear that case. Not unusual, right? What is a little bit unusual is that Judge Thomas, Justice Thomas, wrote a very long explanation. Well, not very long, about four pages, longer than normal. Most of the time, these things are decided without any explanation. But Judge Thomas wrote this, this dissent, essentially, or this explanation for why he was denying certiorari. And he's explaining that it's because it has to do with another case that he thought was wrongly decided. We're talking about gay marriage. We're talking about Obergefell case. We're talking about uh, the situation where uh, the court came down and ruled that, that gay marriage, that homosexual marriage was a constitutional right across the board in the United States. We saw that case come, come out several years ago, and now it's sort of coming back up into the mix. So what is going on here? We have this statement from Judge Thomas that came out today. And we, we got, you know, it, it's making the waves on Twitter because this is sort of indicative of how the court might transform over the next decade, two decades, three decades, four or five decades, if that next judge sits on the court for 40 or 50 years. And so this story was a, a originally pinged, a, a flagged by this fellow here. His name is Mark Joseph Stern. And here is what he said. He said, on Twitter, the Supreme Court turned away Kim Davis's case, but Thomas, joined by Alito, wrote a jaw-dropping rant taking direct aim at Obergefell and suggesting that SCOTUS must overturn the right to marriage equality in order to protect free exercise. One more time, the SCOTUS must overturn the right to marriage equality in order to protect free exercise of your religion, right? Your free exercise of, of how you practice 
your faith. And so we have this sort of tension here that we see a lot in law. On the one side, we've got this, this goal to have equality of marriage, equal rights. We want to have you know, same-sex couples have the same rights as, uh, as you know, op- heterosexual couples. We want them to have the equality and, and sort of partake in the same institution of marriage. That's on the one side. But on the other side, you've got this tension that's naturally built into the Constitution. What about the people who are religious who say, yeah, but my freedom to practice my religion, which is which is embodied by the First Amendment and my you know my free association, free free speech, all of those different freedoms that we get in that amendment, they're saying that if I want to practice my religion and I don't want to bake a cake for a homosexual company couple or I don't want to perform in a homosexual wedding or any of those things, you've seen these tensions pop up, and they're clawing it back and they're saying we want to practice our religion, we disagree with that. And we don't want any part of it, essentially. So now these cases are coming up. And this is going to be something that does come up, I think, before the end of the year. This is going to be another case, and I'm going to cover that in a minute, about a situation that goes in front of the Supreme Court where those two tensions are going to be highly at play. Both sides are going to be pulling in either direction. So I want to analyze just this statement from Justice Thomas because it is something that I think is very uh, explanatory. It's going to show you how the court might shift over the coming decades. So let's back up a little bit. Let's spend a little bit of time talking about this case. So what were we talking about in the case that actually equalized marriage or, you know, or or allowed homosexual couples to actually get married and required states from across the United States to recognize those marriages? Well, it started the, the basis of this started from the 14th Amendment. So we're going we're gonna to see what this case actually looks like and who voted where and how this all settled out. But it's important to know that this is all stemming from the 14th Amendment. So after the Civil War, we had a, a period of what we call Reconstruction. But the country was torn apart, North versus the South, massive bloodshed, the deadliest you know, battle by body casualties in American history where you know, both sides were Americans, both sides killing each other, you know, right on the same continent, right in each other's backyards, horrific, awful war. And as a result, we needed to reconstruct the country. So we passed a lot of amendments right around this time. So in 1868, we passed the 14th Amendment. And I'm going to read you the pertinent section here in a second. But remember, this pa- this happened in 1868. We also passed the 13th Amendment, which basically banned slavery, and then the 15th Amendment, which did some other things. So the 14th Amendment is what I want to talk about here. And the the the, the text of the language, the text of the amendment is uh, here. It's, it's not super complicated, but there's a lot going on. So this is the 14th Amendment, Section 1. And this first part here is talking about uh, sort of birthright citizenship. It says that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States, nor, this is where we're, we're sort of diving into this, this issue, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So this is the due process part, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So these two things here that we're talking about, due process of law, and equal protection under the law are both embodied in the 14th Amendment. And if you look here, this is incorporating all of this to the states. So if you actually have read the Constitution, you'll, you'll see that a lot of this language sounds pretty similar. I thought we had due process in the Fifth Amendment, and I thought we had all of these other concepts elsewhere in the Constitution. Well, the issue is, is that all applied to the federal government. It didn't apply to the state. So now these are different. These All of these rights and liberties are being incorporated into the states. When the country was originally founded, we had the federal government and we had state governments and they had different rights and they had different you know, privileges and things that they could do. And so what the 14th Amendment was doing is saying, you know, all that stuff that we've talked about that's applicable under the federal government, we're also going to make that applicable to the states because we didn't want the states to start passing their own individual laws. We didn't want Alabama to say everybody had to be segregated, but Maine to say uh, segregation was, un, you know, was dis- disallowed. So we wanted equal protection of the law. We wanted due process of law. And since that game incorporated to the states, then what ended up happening is, well, so, so let me back up. So we have all of these sort of trickling down to the states. And now what the courts are doing is they're expanding these concepts. So they're expanding this idea of equal protection of the law. You can see here, this is not a complicated. This is not a really long statute. This is it. This is section one. It says, 
cannot deny any person equal protection of the law. It says we can't, same thing, cannot deprive any person of any life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So what do these things mean? What does equal protection mean? What does due process of law mean? These things are very esoteric, very hard to define. And so what the courts are doing is they're saying that equal protection and due process of law, these are, these are really big, you know, sort of vague concepts, but they're incrementally recognizing other rights in the law. So they're saying, well, look, we know that the, the First Amendment guarantees your right to free assembly, free speech, free religion, you know, free practice of religion, all of those things. We know that the Second Amendment has rights to, you know, your, your ability to be uh, you know, possessing of, of firearms and protect your personal property, protect your life, protect your family. We recognize those things. So now what we, what we want to do is we want to kind of view the Constitution as a whole, and we want to read in other rights into that. So in addition to all of those things, right? Protect your home, protect your freedom of speech, protect your religion, blah, 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 all those things that we as Americans love and value and treasure. We're also going to sort of extend those out into other things. So the U.S. Constitution may not say anything about marriage. The 14th Amendment doesn't say anything about marriage, but the United States, through its precedent, through its legal judicial findings, has determined that there is a fundamental right to get married. The court has said that. The court has said that, you know, procreation, the ability to have a family, you know, we can't prohibit people from getting married to people of other colors and we can't prohibit certain, you know, we can't, there's certain things that the, the Constitution sort of just naturally has that are congruent with it. And marriage is one of those things. So under Supreme Court law, Supreme Court precedent, what we have seen is that they have sort of traditionally recognized the institution of marriage is being fundamental. When there are other laws or other governors or other people who want to infringe on your right to go get married, the court has pushed back and says, you can't do that. You can't pass those laws. Those are unconstitutional. You can't deny somebody the right to get married unless there's some sort of due process. You can't say that that couple can't get married, but that couple can because equal protection of the law dictates that they have the same rights as these other people do. So the court has fundamentally agreed with that for a long period of time. Fast forward from 1868, the states have all of that in place. We're still having this conversation about, you know, gay marriage and homosexual marriage and all of these different uh, issues that are now sort of bubbling up in our society. And we have a 5-4 decision that takes place and it finds that the 14th Amendment, the amendment that I just described, requires that homosexual marriage, that same-sex marriage is now constitutional, okay? It's sort of extending those rights into this different purview of life and saying that this is now valuable. The court is coming through and saying, we can't just deny you marriage because if we, if we do that, the law is going to be treating two dip, disparate people unequally. It's going to allow the same sex couples to get married. I'm sorry, the, the opposite sex couples to get married, but not the same sex couples. That's not the equal protection of the law. And so when this decision came out, this is how the court split. So the court split here. You can see that these five judges all voted in favor of constitutional recognition of same-sex marriage. So we have Kennedy, we have Breyer, we have Kagan, Ginsburg, Sotomayor. On the right wing of the court, Roberts, Scalia, Alito, and Thomas, they all disagreed with this case. Okay, now this was the case where there were a number of same-sex couples. They were challenging the constitutionality of uh, of state laws that basically said that you cannot get married. So there were laws on the books that says no marriage allowed. And it also said that, uh, that, that if you got married in another state that did allow it, they weren't going to recognize it. So when this case went to the Supreme Court, the left wing of the court, they found that constitutional right exists. The right wing of the court said that it didn't. The majority, the, so the people who sort of won in a 5-4 decision, they're saying that marriage is a fundamental right. It's protected by the Constitution. Same-sex marriage is no different than regular marriage. And that if you exclude somebody from this fundamental right of marriage, then you are violating their due process. They have a right to get married. It's a fundamental right. We recognize it in our country because you're not giving them, that to them. You're taking away that right without affording them due process of law, which means that they're not getting the opportunity to challenge it. They don't get to fight for their marriage rights. It's just being taken from them. The other rationale is that it was equal protection. I've already explained that. Now, the dissent, so the right wing of the court, the, 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 the side that Thomas is on, came through, and they said no. They didn't really make an opinion on homosexual marriage or same-sex marriage, but they did have issue with how the court 
created this new right, according to them. They're saying that the court here, again, making very little comment on, you know, the morality of homosexual marriage, very little commentary on, uh, you know, whether it's you know morally acceptable or whether it should be a part of society. They're not really talking about that. And in fact, they go, th go so far as to say this may even be good policy. Maybe we should do this. But they're just saying that the court is the wrong mechanism to create this new right. So the conservative part of the court, they're saying that the court is just way overstepping its authority. They're saying that at this point, they're acting more like a Congress that, than a court. They're creating new law. They're manufacturing new rights. They're reading rights into the Constitution and into the 14th Amendment that don't exist. So if, if we re, you know, reread that 14th Amendment, you're going to see that it doesn't talk about marriage. It doesn't talk about homosexual marriage, same-sex marriage, uh, you know, uh, heterosexual marriage, polygamy. It doesn't talk about any of those things. It just says due process and equal protection. So the conservative court judges are saying, you just can't do that. You know, if it's a political issue, that should go through Congress. Or if you think this should be an amendment and part of our Constitution, well, then we should go through the amendment process. Just like we passed the 13th Amendment to prohibit slavery and indentured servitude, we should pass maybe the 28th Amendment that says we should have same-sex marriage or homosexual marriage recognized across state lines. But the court is saying we didn't do that. In this situation, you had five judges who were unelected judges who sort of you know, thought this should be the law. And so they, they passed that by judicial fiat. They wrote it into the text of the Constitution, but it doesn't really exist in the text of the Constitution. And so this is really the big divide. You've got the right wing of the court who traditionally says that we need to do what the law says and read it. And if it's included in that text, then we can move forward with that law. And if it's not, we don't get to just go put it in there. We don't get to say, well, look, it's 2020. We know that in 1868, when they were talking about the 14th Amendment, that they didn't even think about homosexual marriage or same-sex marriage, but we think it's appropriate now. So we're just going to kind of cram it in there in that amendment somewhere because we think it fits within this due process and this equal protection stuff. It, it sounds good. It sounds reasonable. And the conservative or the, the, the liberal wing of the court, they're saying, this is fundamental. You know, the, you, this is sort of the natural evolution of this as humans mature and evolve and as society uh, sort of, you know, figures out how it wants to work. We're going to just kind of kind of evolve those those old antiquated, not so important relics of the past. And we're going to just update them. We're going to say, yep, equal protection back then included white people and black people. But equal protection today means all of these other things. And so there's this big tension that exists here. So when we go back to this chart, you're going to see that when this decision came out, it was very, very divided. We had five to four, five on the left, four on the right. Well, a lot has changed very recently. Okay. Scalia is no longer with us. Justice Gorsuch replaced him. We have Kennedy who left and we have Kavanaugh who replaced him. So, so this, this seat Kennedy was sort of a middle of the road type of judge. This has been replaced with Kavanaugh. I'm sorry, was it Gorsuch? I think I have him reversed. So now we, anyways, this is a new judge. I forget who replaced whom, but we have Gorsuch and Kavanaugh here. Scalia is gone. Kennedy is gone. And now this seat is open. So we have a Justice Ginsburg seat, which is open, which may be replaced by Amy Coney Barrett, which would then make this theoretically a 6-3 decision. So if this case were in front of the new court as, as potentially newly constituted, I don't think this case would have been decided that way. I don't think even close. I think it probably would have been a 6-3 because Kennedy, who was the split vote back then, is no longer on the court anymore. And I'm not sure that Kavanaugh or Gorsuch would, would have found the same way that he did. So now in a different situation, we see maybe the flipping of that. And this is what people are concerned about. And people are saying, well, look, you know, that case was already decided. We don't need to spend a lot of time on that. Nothing's going to change. Justice Thomas today just released a statement that is pretty much scolding uh, this entire this entire position on on the, the case. So here we have the Supreme Court of the United States. This is a statement from Thomas J. So just Justice Thomas, this is the case of Kim David versus Dame, David Ermold. And this was on a petition for writ of certiorari to the United States. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. So what's what's happening is this case is is moving on up, and the Supreme Court had said that literally today that this is decided that they are going to deny the writ of certiorari, and Justice Thomas and Justice Alito 
are joining in this opinion that is dissenting or, or, or denying this writ. So they're respecting the writ, but they're denying it. Now, I want to read through this because it is uh, it is it is quite interesting. So I'm going to read through it quickly, but let's let's frame it out just a little bit further. So this is a new case. This is not the original case. So the original case in Obergefell was was a case that's already been decided. It's already been ruled on. It found five to four that there's a same sex marriage, a constitutional recognition of that, a constitutional right to that. This is a new case. So this case was working its way up. And then Kim Davis, we're going to read the facts, but just to preface this, this was a woman who worked for the government and she was responsible for issuing same sex or marriage licenses across the board. You probably remember her from the news. This case has been going on for a while, but she was refusing to give marriage licenses two people who were in same-sex marriages. So the Supreme Court decision came out. She works for the government. She's responsible for doing marriage licenses. Somebody comes in, says, hey, I want a marriage license. I'm going to marry my husband or I'm going to marry my wife. And she says, I can't do that. Sorry, it's against my religion. And this is where that tension comes back in, that tension that I mentioned at the very beginning of the show. This idea that you have a fundamental right to marriage, but you also have a fundamental right to practice your religion. So what happens if those two things, if society is recognizing both of those and they go clashing into each other, what happens? Well, this is what Justice Thomas is talking about. And he's upset that the court recognized this fundamental right to marriage, at least in the same sex context. And here's what he says, and this is pretty brutal, so I want you to read through it or, or follow me along as we go through it. And he says, in Obergefell, the court read a right to same sex marriage into the 14th Amendment. So they read that right into the 14th Amendment. He's saying it didn't exist, even though that right is nowhere to be found in the text. Several members of the court noted that in the decision, this would threaten religious liberty of many Americans who believe that marriage is a sacred institution between one man and one woman. If the states had allowed to resolve this question through legislation, they could have included accommodations for those religious beliefs. And the court bypassed the democratic process. So uh, Justice Thomas is saying this should have gone through the House. It should have gone through the Senate. This should have gone through your local legislature. should have gone through the states. And by just having the court go ahead and just pass this and say there is now a constitutional requirement that same-sex marriage is recognized, he's saying that is not democratic. It's been decided by four judges or five judges in this case who were appointed, not elected. It's not very democratic. Worse still, though it briefly acknowledged that those with sincerely held religious objections are often decent and honorable, the court went on to suggest that those beliefs espouse a bigoted worldview, saying that it was demeaning to gays and lesbians because it teaches that gays and lesbians are unequal. And they're describing the view of marriage dictated by, by, by uh, those with religious beliefs as imposing stigma and injury. The dissenting justice also predicted that these assaults on the character of fair-minded people will have an effect in society and in court, which is what we're seeing. So now we're seeing a situation where you have people who are on both sides of that aisle and those rights, those fundamental rights that the court has described and they exist in both. Those are now clashing with one another. And he, he's saying that this is, you know, this is just kind of the beginning of it. He's talking about the Kim Davis case. He says specifically, she was a former county clerk in Commonwealth of Kentucky responsible for authorizing marriage licenses. Devout Christian began her tenure as a clerk when her religious beliefs when this existed, that her religious beliefs said that it was between one man and one woman. And then within weeks, the court granted a certiorari in Obergefell and they passed the same sex marriage uh, case. So it said that now this stuff is constitutional. And so as a result, she found herself with a choice between her religious beliefs and her job. When she chose to follow her faith without any statutory protection of her religious beliefs, she sued almost immediately. For, she was sued almost immediately for violating the constitutional rights of the same sex couples. And so, you know, this was a case that continued to create contention and it went up to the Supreme Court and now they refused it. But the question becomes what happens in a different situation where there's a different court? So in this in this court's term, this case was declined. They said, we're not going to hear it. Kim, we know that you've got an issue. We know that you're being sued, all this stuff. Sorry. We've already said in Obergefell that this is a constitutional right uh, to a 5-4 decision. We've already decided that. So we can't do anything about it here in this case. Sorry. But that's because the court right now is a 4-4. Four or it's, it's only eight of them. And if this case comes before a four to four court or with an eight person court, 
probably not going to be decided. But if this case or this issue comes up again, when Amy Coney Barrett is on the court, now we have a 6-3, now we have a tiebreaker court, and the court wants to revisit their prior precedent, maybe they modify it. Maybe they say, listen, that was a bad decision. We want to overturn it. It's bad precedent. And they could do some correcting of the record as it were. And this is what people are concerned about. So uh, Justice Thomas, his opinion goes on and on and on. I'm not going to read it all. But one final note here, he says that the petition implicates important questions about the scope of our decision, but it does not cleanly present them for that reason. I concur in denial of certiorari. So he says important questions about the scope of our decision, but it does not cleanly present them. So what happens if there is a case? that does cleanly present them. So he concurs in the denial, but this petition provides a stark reminder of the consequences by choosing to privilege a novel constitutional right over the, over the religious liberties explicitly protected in the First Amendment. And by doing so undemocratically, the court has created a problem that only it can fix. Until then, Obergefell will continue to have ruinous consequences for religious liberty. That's a pretty solid stake in the ground. If this issue presented cleanly comes up before the Supreme Court again, probably looking like Justice Thomas, at least, uh, amongst all of the other conservative judges, is going to be a vote to change that past decision. He's saying that only we can fix this. We passed, you know, we, we wrote a case that was essentially a case that was law, you know, passed sort of by judicial fiat that this right now exists. Only we can modify that and correct the past reasoning. So just something to flag. You know, this is not a commentary on on this issue particularly, uh, but it is it is interesting because if this happens, the court could really shift in a way that is going to spill over into a lot of rights that people sort of take for granted. You know, we kind of thought this issue was done and over with. We all kind of thought the Roe versus Wade stuff was done and over with. I think in large part, most of it is just because the justices and Judge Thomas and Judge uh, Gorsuch and Judge Roberts in particular, you know, a lot of these people, they're, they're, they're cautious when it comes to overturning long, you know, historic precedent. I think Roe versus Wade is probably one that's a little bit safer and really Casey versus Planned Parenthood are, are, are you know, less likely to be attacked. Just, just speaking hypothetically or just sort of shooting from the hip on those things uh, because it is so ingrained. Remember, we talk about this a lot on this show. The court gets its power from legitimacy. So if the court does a bunch of stuff that is unpopular, then the other branches of government can just say, that's fine. You know, okay, do whatever you want to do. If the, if the American, if the court is ruling against the American public, if the American public says, look, we want abortion, we want homosexual marriage or same-sex marriage, we want all of these things, and the court comes around and starts smacking those down, the court loses its legitimacy, which is really its only enforcement mechanism. So it's got to keep that, which is why I don't think that I'm, we're going to see this massive uh, you know, chopping of old prior precedent. But I could be wrong on that. Certainly what a lot of the conservatives want. So we'll see if that happens. Now, the new Supreme Court terms started today, and it's going to go on for, for some time. Quick summary of a couple of the things that are, that are going to be coming up in the next months. So one of the major cases that is going to be in front of the court is surrounding the infamous Obamacare. So Obamacare is back in front of the Supreme Court. Let me summarize this issue for you. It's not a criminal law issue, but the court is now back in session, and so people are going to be looking for these things. If you remember, this case already went up to the Supreme Court. We, we also saw in the decision, I think it was a five to four decision as well, Justice Roberts sided with the left wing of the court, and they found that Obamacare was constitutional because Justice Roberts wrote the opinion. I think he just said it was just a tax. The Obamacare was just a tax, and the federal government has a lot of power to impose taxes on its citizenry, much to my dismay, unfortunately. Lots of taxes all over the place, the, the court has historically said that's okay. And so if healthcare is just a tax, the court's going to uphold it. Really, in my opinion, this was, this was, this was Roberts trying to, to maintain the legitimacy of the court during a time when we had a new president in place and they were concerned that if he would have smacked down Obamacare, it would have really impacted the legitimacy of the court and would have had a lot of problems. Anyways, this case is back up in front of the Supreme court. It's going to be heard. There's going to be oral arguments this term. The issue now is that the originally there was part of the ACA was that you had to get health care. 
And if you didn't, you had to pay a penalty. That penalty was considered a tax. Donald Trump came into office. He revised the tax code. Taxes are, are lower than they've ever been or significantly lower than they were. And as part of that tax reform plan, they got rid of the individual mandate tax. They no longer say it's a tax. You no longer are penalized for it. So if that's the case, if the only enforcement mechanism in Obamacare was this tax and there is no longer an enforcement mechanism as part of the bill, then doesn't the rest of the bill sort of fall by the wayside? It's sort of what they're saying. They're saying that uh, in this situation, if there's no tax, then the mandate is illegal, okay? If, if the basis for why this was legal in the first place is because it was a tax, and now there is no tax, then was that underlying requirement still legal? The only thing that made that under requirement legal is that it was characterized as a tax. There's no tax anymore. So is that underlying thing still legal anymore? That's what the, that's what the court is going to decide. And if this goes back up and now it's, it's a, instead of a 5-4 decision, it's going to be a 6-3 decision. Or if Roberts is going to stay with the, with the, uh, the, the left wing of the court, could be another 5-4 decision, but this time against Roberts. So that one is going to be coming up and it's going to be interesting to see. There is another case that is taking place out of Arizona. Uh, this, this was a situation in Arizona regarding elections and voting. And what we're going to see is that uh, there are two issues that were bubbling up out of Arizona. One was about... Uh, whether you can drop your ballot off at a different location. So if I'm in a certain precinct and I, I'm supposed to drop my ballot off there and I don't and I take it somewhere else and they say, nope, you can't do that. Take it back to your original precinct. We have that here. You got to report to your regular precinct. If you don't do that, then what happens to your ballot? Is it going to be thrown out or does it have to be counted? So that is also going up to the Supreme Court. We're going to hear about that in this, uh, in this term. We also talked uh, a little bit about uh, homosexual marriage. So we talked about uh, there's going to be another case where the justices will hear a dispute. Yeah, this is exactly what we've talked about. Hear a dispute uh, that pits religious right individuals against non-discrimination protections from the LGBT community. Oral arguments are scheduled for November 4th. So here's what happened in this case. This one's interesting. Lawsuit arose after Philadelphia. So the city of Philadelphia had a contract with a Catholic social services organization to help place kids into foster homes. Catholic groups said, listen, we're going to help you place kids in foster groups, foster homes, but not same sex homes, not same sex marriage uh, homes. So, you know, that's against Catholicism um, and we can't do that. So then the city of Philadelphia terminated their relationship with the Catholic organization saying we have non-discrimination ordinances. Uh, you know, same sex marriage is now a right. It's a constitutional right. So you have to comply with us or we're going to kick you out of the program. And so the organization now, this Catholic organization, which is represented by somebody else, is saying that they were unfairly being targeted. You know, they're religious contractors. Uh, and so their, their freedom of religion, their freedom to you know, operate their business in conformity with their religious doctrine is now at stake. That's a violation of your First Amendment rights, free exercise clause. So you see where these two things are just going right into tension. And so uh, this is going to be revisited this term, and we're going to see how the judges do with that, whatever, you know, we're going to see how they hold on that. Uh, we've got another case for the federal housing stuff kind of a uh, kind of a little boring basically what's happening here there's another situation where there is a uh, there's a there's a, an agency that exists within the executive branch it's called the FHFA the Federal Housing Finance Agency which Congress created put under the purview of the executive branch and then they nominated somebody to run that organization well w if it's within the executive branch then the president or the executive, you know, the, the administration has the ability to maneuver and do things with that body that they want to. And so what happened here is that Congress said you can only fire, you can only terminate the person who's at the top of this agency for neglect or for sort of, you know, some sort of level of like gross incompetence. And so what that means is that there's sort of a a uh, blurring of the separation of powers here. We see a situation where Congress is trying to reach over into the executive branch and tell them how to run their agency. So this is all being challenged and the court is going to have to decide whether the Congress can literally, you know, sort of curtail the executive's ability to fire or terminate that individual. A little bit of a boring case, but we'll see what happens with that. And then the last case that's coming up 
is uh, very similar to what we've been talking about in Breonna Taylor. Remember in Breonna Taylor's case, we've been talking about the grand jury transcripts and Daniel Cameron releasing the grand jury records. He released some of the records, but he didn't release any of the information, at least to my knowledge at this point in time, about the recommendations on charges or any of that stuff. So this is the same situation involving this fellow, Robert Mueller. Robert Mueller, of course, was investigating Donald Trump as part of the uh, Russian collusion hoax and all of that stuff. Well, he had his own grand jury who reviewed a lot of this stuff and he presented evidence to them and all of, there was a lot of material that took place. You remember this for the last two years, collusion, 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 all over the place for two and a half years. And now the Democrats, they want to know what happened in the grand jury proceedings. They want all of those records. Donald Trump and the Trump administration, they want to make sure those things are all sealed and done. You know, they don't want all of that being aired out. They want to protect the legitimacy of the grand jury proceedings. And so both of these two parties are hashing it out in court. And this case is going to go, it's already up. It's scheduled to be heard this term in the Supreme Court. So we'll follow that along. Uh, and we'll see how these cases unfold, which is a good reminder to subscribe. You want to make sure that you're part of these conversations. All right. And then the last story today, before we get to some of the chat, a lot of legal stuff today, but this one, we got, we got two, we got two bad popo. We got two bad hombres out there who are part of the criminal justice system. And we want to make sure that uh, they are held accountable the same way you or I would be found this yesterday. So this is a letter sent by seven top aides to the Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, alleging the state's top lawyer has committed multiple criminal violations. So this letter uh, was posted first by Robert F Flo Flohetsky, Tony Flo Plo Plohetsky. That is a last name right there. All right. So he sends this letter. So this was sent over by the by, by people working for the attorney general out of Texas. Quick reminder, attorney attorney general is the top attorney in the state. It's a very high position, uh, sort of like a second governor in many states. So it's a big deal when you have a bunch of your subordinates write a letter uh, indicating that you've broken the law on multiple occasions. Not good. So here's what we have. This was uh, originally drafted on October 1st, 2020. So just a couple days ago, it says, Mr. Simpson, this letter is intended to serve as notice that the office of the attorney general on September 4th, we, bu 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 we under uh, appropriate, send it to law enforcement. He's violating the law of Texas. We have good faith to uh, belief that the attorney general is violating federal law, state law, including prohibitions related to improper influence, abuse of office, bribery, other potential criminal offenses. Each signatory below, each signatory has knowledge of facts relevant to these potential offenses and has provided statements concerning those facts to the appropriate law enforcement authority. Additionally, today, the undersigned notified the attorney general via text that they have reported the violations to the appropriate law enforcement authority. A copy of the text messages is attached here too. And who signed this thing? Just about everybody. First Assistant Attorney General, Deputy Attorney General for Policy and Strategy Initiatives. We've got James Jake Brinkman. We've got Jeffrey Matier. We've got Deputy Attorney General for Civil Litigation. So what you're seeing here are these different divisions. You've got the First Assistant Attorney General. That's sort of like, you know, the second in command. You've got the Deputy Attorney General for Policy and Strategy Initiatives. You've got uh, for Civil Litigation. You've got Legal Counsel. You've got Criminal Justice. You've got Attorney General for Administration. You've got Deputy First, another Assistant Attorney General. So you've got a lot of people here who are high up in this Attorney General organization who are all signing this document saying, our boss broke the law on a number of different occasions, and we've got the evidence to prove it. So the attorney general comes back out and he says, oh, gosh, this is all just disgruntled employees. They're not happy with me at all. He says specifically that uh, this is his statement. He says they're false allegations by rogue employees. The Texas attorney general's office was referred a case from Travis County regarding allegations of crimes relating to the FBI other government agencies and individuals. My obligation is to conduct the investigation upon such referral because employees from my office impeded the investigation. And because I knew Nate Paul, I ultimately decided to hire an outside independent prosecutor to make his own independent determination. Despite the effort by rogue employees and their false allegations, I will continue to seek justice in Texas and will not be resigning. So it sounds like from what we're able to gather here that there was somebody under investigation for something and he maneuvered the case to a certain degree into somebody else or he's you know he's 
he was trying to impede the investigation. He's blaming his blaming his emplo- employees for impeding the investigation. It's a lot of a uh, lot of interesting things going on here, and we will certainly follow that around. So uh, that's this attorney Paxton, AG Attorney General Paxton. We will be following this one for a while, but there is a lot of smoke here. A lot of smoke when you have everybody from your different departments, your different agencies, all signing a letter saying that you are a bad hombre. That is not good. And we have another very bad popo from our own backyard. That's right. Right here in Arizona, we have uh, indication that there was a Maricopa County Sheriff's officer who was just charged with unlawful sexual conduct. Not too good. MCSO deputy charged by suspicion, on suspicion, unlawful sexual conduct by an officer. So MCSO, unless, uh, here we go. It's Gary Kaplan, 46, arrested and booked October 4th. So that was yesterday on suspicion of two counts of unlawful sexual conduct by a peace officer, said the sheriff's office spokesman, Sergeant Bryant Vanegas. Uh, the sheriff's officer website refused, or referred to the charges as two counts of lewd and lascivious acts. No details. Because it just happened yesterday. So we checked the court records, the court docket, and all that stuff. Nothing filed just yet. We are going to have more about this. Um, Bad popo, not too good. So that's it for the show. Let's take a look at some of the chats because we have, uh, if you're in the chat, go ahead and say hello and we'll turn those on. Say hi to everybody here. See if there's any questions. If you've got some questions, let's throw them in there. We'll get to them. All right. All right, in place. Okay, here we go. My internet is, I don't know what is going on here. Okay. Hey, r r Law Group, can you look into the constitutional issues with Leon Valley's city council as well as the constitutional rights violated by the chief of police? To the constitutional, all right. All right, so now I got the chat open. Let's see here. Okay, Chris Kelly, hi, live from England here. What's up, Chris? Good to see you. We've got D. Dudar, hello, hello. Zach Wallace says hello again. Good to see you. We've got, can you look into the constitutional issues of Leon Valley's city council? Chief of police against First Amendment auditors before. Happy to take a look at that. Have not seen either one of those come through. In place of a system of justice that people can look at, understand, and trust in, we have this nightmare of legalese, mumbo jumbo, pathetic. You know, I think that's a pretty fair criticism of the legal world. It is surprising. It is really kind of disturbing to me also. When I read some of these statutes, I've done it here on this show. This show has been very interesting because I can actually read statutes and I have an excuse to go and read statutes from other states and see how they do things. And we were doing that. I can't remember what state it was. It must have been uh, Wisconsin or one of the other stories that we were covering and I was reading their statutes and it felt like it was literally written like 600 years ago. I mean, really, really old language, really antiquated law, uh, very poorly designed statutes in my mind. It's concerning to me that we haven't updated these things uh, for 2020 for the new, for the new uh, generation, but that's how we stand. Uh, Somebody asked, so how does law, treat marriage? Is it religious or something else? So marriage is a fundamental right. It's the, you know, the the Supreme Court has said that this is, this exists as a fundamental right. It's the same thing, uh, you know, the same reason anybody else can get married, the same reason that you have, uh, you know, all of the other rights that you enjoy on a daily basis. The Supreme Court has added that at least the same sex marriage stuff into your rights. Previously, there's been a lot of case law about marriage. So, so traditional marriage had already been incorporated. And you know, Burgefell, they just extended that over to same-sex couples as well. Do you agree with the Michigan Supreme Court's decision that struck down the executive orders made by Whitmer regarding COVID? That comes from Lorenzo Greasy Bottom. So Lorenzo, I actually was just, just looking at that story before we started the show today. I did see that that judge struck it down and I'm not sure what the basis was. So I've not read that opinion yet, but in my mind, I think that most of these lockdown orders should be deemed unconstitutional. Uh, I, I, t- to me, what we have been seeing is, in my opinion, a, a, a taking of people's rights without the due process of law. So we saw this in Arizona, okay? And I was a big proponent of this, this fellow by the name of Tom Hatton from the, uh, he, he's the CEO of Mountainside Fitness. It's a gym 
in Arizona uh, that, you know, it's a, nice, it's, a, it's a big box chain gym. But when all of these lockdowns started, all the gyms were shutting down. Well, Tom Hatton stood up and he said, no, you can't just close me down. You can't close my gym down and keep the, uh, the grocery stores open and the gas stores open and the hair salons open and all of these other things open because you're, you're closing my place of business and not their place of business. And equal protection of the law says I'm entitled to those same protections. So why are you closing my business down? Well, the courts, you know, which are, in, which are part of the government, the, the, governor, which is part of the government and the legislatures, which are part of the government, they all investigate themselves and they find that everything's fine, that the government has all the power and the private business owners don't. So I was, I was really emphatic about what he was doing. I thought that it was the right message. I think it's the right analysis. Uh, to this point in time, I don't know why a gym is any uh, more dangerous than a hair salon or a gas station or a grocery store. Nobody's been able to, to sort of come up with concrete evidence as to why that is. Now you can come to uh, speculation about that, right? You can say, well, it's a lot of people and they're all breathing heavily and they're all, you know, running around and touching the same stuff. I get it. You can speculate about all of these things all over the place, but before you deprive somebody of their rights, of their livelihood, of all the tens of thousands of employees that, you know, that business employed, maybe we have some, some actual concrete analysis some concrete evidence more than just a governor saying, I got to do this decision because it looks good politically, or I have to do this thing because uh, I'm concerned about these. You know, we, we want to see some actual evidence. We want to see this thing litigated. And he took this up to the superior courts, and he actually was making some pretty good progress. And then the governor just, you know, manipulated the rules on the back end. And so he had to get into compliance with them. So his arguments about being denied your right to exercise, you know, your business, the, the, the being denied the right to run your business when all of these other businesses are okay was a violation of his due process, was a violation of his equal protection rights, which I strongly agree with. I didn't see any basis for it. And so I was very supportive of what he was doing. And I'm still supportive of the people who want to live their lives and get back to work and be responsible adults. I am in strong disagreement with this nanny state government that tells us that we have to uh, do all of these things because some bureaucrat somewhere thought it was a good idea. I think we're all adults. I think we have the ability to think for ourselves and conduct our lives accordingly. And I'm happy, very, very, very happy to start seeing some judges say enough of this stuff already. You know, you can make an argument that the government has a lockdown, has lockdown authority for a certain period of time. But remember, we were told that this was going to be 14 days or 30 days, you know, 15 days to slow the spread. You remember all that stuff? And it just keeps going and going and going. And so when the government when the purpose of the government is to restrict you from doing certain things, there are constitutional frameworks that the government has to follow. They have to do things. They can't just start taking away people's rights. So one of the ways that they do it is they say, look, we have to, we have to sort of restrict these things, but we're going to do it in the, in the way that's the least restrictive necessary to meet our goals. That's the, that's literally the constitutional language, the least restrictive means necessary to achieve the government's goals. Well, are these lockdowns for months and months and months and months the least restrictive means to, to secure the government's goals? Well, now it's time that the federal judges and, and our legislatures and our governors and, and you and me and everyday citizens were finally saying it's not the least restrictive anymore. And if your goals are to make sure that the hospital beds are not getting overwhelmed, there are other ways to do that, too. You don't have to shut down everything. So maybe you should modify your lockdown orders in a way that is more in in alignment with what the constitution says. Okay. Other questions. Zach Wallace. Uh, the general assessment of the Rittenhouse case is that he's a justified self-defense case. Do you see him succeeding or is it likely that the court team will railroad him due to leftist public pressure? Great question. A lot to unpack there. I do think it is a self-defense case. I've made several videos on that. We did a frame by frame. There's been more videos that came out. Uh, I know his legal team, the fight back group released a new video, but there wasn't anything new in there that we really haven't covered. I think it's clearly self-defense. I think the probable cause statement that was written by the prosecutors was written in a way that even sounds like self-defense. You know, they wrote this statement to move forward with the charges against him, but every single paragraph to me, and we covered it on this show, read like self defense. Now, I just saw a tweet today from Lynn Wood, who is sort of the spearhead, the, the figurehead of Kyle Rittenhouse's defense team. And he said specifically in this tweet, you can check his Twitter on it, that there were five defense lawyers who were on Kyle Rittenhouse's team. And I responded specifically, I said, Oh, really, who are those five people? I would really like to know who they are. Because 
uh, at this point in time, I've only identified one. And we covered him on this show, and I'm not even sure that attorney is still on his team anymore. But if you go to L. Lynn Wood's website, if you go to John Pierce's website, uh, Lynn says that he's, he's you know, this, this really competent, experienced criminal defense attorney. And if you go on his website, if you look even at his practice areas, literally, I checked just before this show, not a single one of them says criminal defense. If you go to his resume, if you say about Lynn Wood, you'll see this big, long, you know, uh, bullet point after bullet point about all this amazing stuff that he's done. Not a lot of criminal law in there, right? Just not. Uh, same with John Pierce, a lot of media management, a lot of defamation stuff, a lot of civil law stuff, but not a lot of criminal law. And to me, that is concerning without a question. Uh, it, it's concerning to me. He said there were five of them. I didn't check my Twitter, but I don't see that there, you know, there's been any response. I don't know who these other five attorneys were. If, if he's got five criminal defense attorneys who are competent and they know how to handle things in, in Wisconsin and Illinois, then great. I'm optimistic about it. But if they don't, if it's a bunch of these other attorneys who are just sort of milking the media fanfare, you know, I'm not, I'm not particularly optimistic about that for the person who matters most, which is Kyle Rittenhouse, unfortunately. Okay, some other questions. Ma the Fox said Rittenhouse made statements contradictory to his penal interests. If they were important, do you think they'd be listed in the initial complaint? Uh, yeah, yeah. Any admissions all, are almost always written in the in the complaint. Elwood seems like a scammer. Not real sure what he's doing. I mean, he's posting weird stuff on Twitter. I feel like he's not particularly focused on being a defense attorney. I feel like he's more focused on uh, increasing his followers, which is concerning. I live in a mixed state. Some cities heavy liberal, some very, very conservative, conservative, and boy, is it obvious which is which by COVID rules. Yeah, I think that's probably fair. Nobleness D says the goal was to destroy the middle class without manipulating the money supply this time. Everyone needs to read the Gulag Archipelago. It is important for these times. Why doesn't the First Amendment give us the right not to be willing participants to the BLM protest? In other words, the right to remain silent. John Perryman, John Perryman sent me an email. Actually, you sent me an email today. I saw that. I know that you linked over some, uh, some YouTube videos and I have not watched them yet, but I did get your email. Why doesn't the first amendment give us the right not to be willing participants to the BLM protests? In other words, the right to remain silent. So I, I think you do have the right to remain silent. I don't think there's anything that forces you to be a part of the protests. I think what's what's happening in the in the situation that you're describing probably is you know these protesters are coming up to people in restaurants and these people are sitting there peacefully and these other people are encroaching on what you're doing. And that is clearly criminal in most of these cases, right? In Arizona, we have a statute called disorderly conduct. If you go around and you are just loud and being disorderly, that's a crime. So these people who are going up and taking beer off other people's tables, these people who are, you know, on, on uh, megaphones, blasting people, you know, we saw the video of this group of protesters, rioters, whatever you want to call them, surrounding people and telling them to raise their fist up in the air and stuff like that. That's interference. It, you can call it public nuisance. You can call it uh, threatening and intimidating. That's a crime. Public nuisance is a crime. A disorderly conduct is a crime, uh, you, you know. Criminal damage, if they're breaking things or crime, criminal trespass, those are all crimes. They're all crimes. Most of the activity that you see in these videos is criminal activity, but the police aren't doing anything about it, in large part because I think the politicians are telling them to stand down or the police are fed up with it. And if, if people are clamoring out there, defund the police, the police don't have any incentive to go out there and write these people uh, tickets for this type of violation. And if they do, and those people get booked into custody, then you've got these different organizations. I think Kamala Harris and some of these other, you know, celebrities are all LeBron James donating to these organizations that will then bond those people back out. And so it's just revolving door of this stuff, but you're not required to participate in those things. It's just that the government, which is supposed to be protecting your liberty has now given up on that. They've said, well, nothing we can do about that. And so you have to deal with it, unfortunately. I like how you can be dragged off for not wearing a mask while watching a football game where the players aren't wearing masks. <laughs> yeah, I know. We are living in sort of uh, insanity at the moment. Regarding President Trump labeling Antifa and KKK as domestic terrorist group, would that declaration and the ensuing cases to follow be within the confines of the Constitution? 
Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that I understand that question, but it sounds like you're asking, so in case it would be within the con. So it's, to me, what that sounds like is he's just labeling these groups. He's, he's basically putting them on a list that, you know, the FBI and his Department of Justice would be pursuing. So, you know, he's saying, okay, th these are domestic terrorist groups now. They're on that list. Now you people go and investigate them. And so if the FBI, if the DOJ, if they can find criminality, if they can find problems with these groups that they're investigating, then they're not going to have to go and create additional law. So in other words, they're not going to have to go, you know, create a racketeering law just specifically for the KKK. They just find some racketeering that the KKK is doing and they charge them. But the KKK is now a group that's on a, it's on a list that's going to be getting more, more attention. So I don't think any of the constitutional, you know, provisions of, of anything that you're asking about are, are changing or anything. It's just one group. You know, so the FBI was originally focused on these people. Now they're focusing on these people or adding them to that list. So that's all that is. I don't think it uh, requires much more legal analysis other than that. Based on what's gone down. So this question comes from uh, SJ Jar Jar Binks. Based on what's gone down so far with Rittenhouse, do you think that his team will be able to get around the lethal response he gave in defense of property? So we, we did talk about some of the self-defense stuff. We talked about, we talked a little bit about defense of property, but not, but not really. Uh, I don't, I don't think that that came into play other than that was the original basis for why he was there. But once his life became threatened, so literally at the beginning of that ordeal, as soon as he was being chased by Rosenbaum around that corner in that first video that we saw the first set of bullets that he fired back at Rosenbaum, once that, once that came into play, he, his life at that point was threatened. So I don't think any of the defensive property stuff is, is particularly pertinent at that point in time. Once he is threatened, that starts off the dominoes, in other words. His life was threatened, and it didn't really, it never went back to the defensive property. There's a pretty big distinguishment between defensive life and defensive property. You can't, traditionally, this is an example that we talk about in law school. There's a hypothetical, it's in tort law, we're talking about a situation where a guy had a huge piece of property, he had a huge home, and what he was doing was uh, putting basically shotguns in the doors and in the windows. So if you open the door, the shotgun would go off and it'd blast you in the chest and you'd be killed because he was sick of people breaking into his properties. You know, this was like in the 1800s or 1700s or one of those cases. And the, the courts came back through and they said, you can't do that, brother. You can't just put shotguns in your windows and, and in your doors to kill somebody because even though it's your property we're not we value life more than property so we're not going to let you kill somebody to protect some property now if you were living in that house because this guy wasn't and somebody was breaking into your property and you were in the house that's is that's what distinguishes the cases because at that point you're not protecting your property anymore you're protecting your life you're protecting your family and in that case the law says yes we do allow lethal force when you're protecting against a threat against your life but not against property so uh, in, in Rittenhouse's case I don't think that that was even really an issue I think he may have been there originally to be sort of a watch uh, individual but once he became attacked and now became about his life not his property uh, from JW at RR Law Group, post POTUS election, what are the top steps that either political side should do to stabilize the law enforcement unrest fractures? Which side is more likely to help the situation? Whoo, that is a good question. Really good question. Uh, I've advocated on this show for more transparency and more accountability. And I am absolutely willing to help and do whatever I can do to help push that forward. I would like to see uh, more, more, more transparency across the board, in particular with identifying bad cops, getting their personnel files, stop having the police unions be allowed to wipe records clean. In Arizona, our Phoenix Police Department had their records essentially clean. Basically anything outside of five years or something, I, I could be wrong on the exact dates, but their records were just getting purged. So a cop could do something bad, wait a certain period of time, and then their record would be purged, and then do it again, and then wait, and that record would, would be purged. And the problem with that is you can't identify these repeat bad actors, right? In the Derek Chauvin, George Floyd case, I think Derek Chauvin, after an investigation, like 17 other or something like that, you know, a dozen, half dozen, or, or, or a couple dozen uh, other violations, other problems. And the issue is we want to identify those people and pull them off the streets, give them desk duty or ask them to go, you know, do something else. Because if they're, if, if they're these types of officers who are involved in repeat offenses or repeat use of force claims or any of those things, 
we want to move them out. But we do want to keep the good police. We want to elevate the good police. So I am not part of the defund the police movement. I'm not part of the all cops are bad people. I think there's a lot of amazing cops, a lot of really, really great guys out there and, and women. And we want to you know, we want to raise them up and push the bad people down. But the only way we can do that is if we have a conversation about it. We have to talk about it. It's part of the reason I started this show is to show you the bad popo, is to memorialize them on the internet, on YouTube, on this channel. Because what happens is these cops will get into trouble. They'll get charged like like this guy with sexual you know, indecency, lewd and lascivious behavior, all of that stuff. And they'll retire. They'll resign. They'll go across the county to a different county. They'll work there for a little while. They'll go to a different state. They'll come back. And it's this big, incestuous, gross, uh, revolving door of just bad individuals in our justice system. And we got to get that out. Now, our is anything of what we're seeing in the streets, is BLM, is Antifa, are any of those protests, are any of those rioters doing anything to help our cause? In my opinion, the answer is a hard no. Nope, they're not. They were, at one point, we thought that these protests were good, we thought that things were moving in the right direction. Oh my goodness, the American public is now interested in this conversation. What a relief, finally we're talking about these things. Stuff that I've been working on for the last seven years is now coming to the forefront. Wow, what a great gift until they started burning down Wendy's, torching used parking lots, shooting people, you know, blocking traffic, beating people up, stealing their beers, all of those things, looting stores, that doesn't help the cause. That hurts it more than I think they'll even recognize. And so every time they take to those streets and do more damage, the pendulum is, they're helping the pendulum swing further the other way. And it's gonna be more support for the officers, more support, more revulsion, more uh, lack of willingness to do any of these meaningful reforms Unfortunately, it's been a big, it's been a big missed opportunity as far as I can tell. So we'll see, you know, we'll see if that kind of quiets down. But what I would like to see is scaling back qualified immunity. I would like to see a lot more transparency on the Brady list. I would like to see basically the end of police unions. I think they're a huge part of the problem. And that's a good start. We'll see where it goes from there. Let's see. Be sweet to your cops. They are really getting some horrible treatment, and I have found they appreciate this support so much they deserve to know the silent majority exists. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's just like anything. You know, there, there are good lawyers. There are bad lawyers. There are good doctors. There are bad doctors. There are good cops. There are bad cops. And we want more good officers. And just like anything, it requires that the good cops call out the bad cops, just like we do here on this channel. If there's bad lawyers, I call them out. I've called them out historically because they're bad lawyers, right? If you're just sitting around allowing people who are doing things that are wrong to continue to do things in your sphere of influence, you're kind of part of the problem a little bit. So these good cops who are covering for the bad cops are just as bad in my mind. And a big part of what needs to change is the culture. We want more of these cops to speak out. We want more of them to do the right thing. And if we can encourage that somehow by maybe saying that, uh, you know, we're not going to defund the police or by maybe saying that not all cops are bad by having just a real human dialogue about this thing. Maybe we'll see some uh, improvement. All right. Greg in Houston. I love your position on cops. He says, uh, Leon, no one's no one in the mob was shouting. Let's make this a citizen's arrest. Good cops get fired for calling out bad cops. Yeah, that's part of the problem. It's a huge part of the problem. I don't know why there's not more protections for them for that. There's a clear link between BLM and the weather underground. Is the problem, is this problematic for the Marxist BLM movement? That question comes from Patrick Waters. We've talked about it on this channel. I've, you know, we, we saw some pretty clear financial delineations between, uh, I think it was the, the BLM project or one of their uh, founded founding websites, the BLM project or something like that. We covered this, I think last week. And, you know, they're just a, an extension of the Chinese Communist Party uh, by their own admissions, you know. And so uh, there are some really interesting uh, things going on. Spare time 24 seven. How is your day going? Pretty good. Pretty good. I love being here with you guys. Uh, BLM, nothing but a racist money grab. Accountability in the prosecutor's office from Matthew Smith. Would love to see a lot more of that. Do you plan on creating a community discord at some point in the future? I'd love to see you create more community tools for engagement. Thank you for all the insightful content. Yeah, Ma the Fox, actually, we are toying around with that literally right now. So I have discord installed. Uh, Miss Faith, if you if you haven't met Miss Faith, uh, you can say hi, Faith, right there in the chat. She's literally 
right behind that wall. She's awesome. She helps me uh, with a lot of the show prep, and she is going to uh, probably be helping me moderate a Discord at some point. I'm not sure that this channel is big enough yet for that right now, quite frankly, um, because I don't want to start something that doesn't have any activity. But as the channel continues to grow, um, you know, we'll we'll uh, we'll see what we can do. We are going to be making some changes for for the channel. Everybody saying hi, Faith. Good, love that. She's in the other room, probably seeing that, and. We, we, we do, we are trying to figure this, this thing out. So I appreciate your patience. I know we were like really putting in a lot too many of those, uh, clips and a lot, you know, the, the channel was a little bit unnavigable and we're going to try to modify that. So, um, we're going to keep this train on the tracks. We're going to talk about a discord and, uh, you know, I'd love to see the channel grow and, and get more engagement and, and do more cool things because the more, uh, I think, I think sort of the more, more engagement we have, the more fun it is for all of us. So for Discord, talk to at Uncivil Law. Mark Smith says, uh, watching from the UK, great channel. At 27K, you'll have more than enough members. I know Discords with 500 plus members from channels with only a few thousand subs. Get back to work, Faith. Uh, yeah, okay. All right, well, well, we'll move ahead with that. We, we started it. We were playing around with it last week, and uh, and we'll, we'll get that moving. I appreciate that. Should they get rid of private prisons? So there's a lot in that issue. Yeah, we are doing some research on this on this private prison thing and seeing how that goes. There's there's there are a lot of problems with that. Yeah, we're going to uh, we're going to cover that on the absentee mail in vote. Do you expect some political buggery between them, the Dems and the Repubs come November? As I'm told, there is concern in the Somali community over this. Yeah, you know, I I am of the mindset that this election is not going to be decided on. Uh, November 3rd. I just don't think that it is. I think that there's probably going to be a lot of legal stuff going on, which is another big reason that uh, I wanted to start this channel. We've got the Supreme Court nomination, we've got the election, and then really we've got the election fallout, which is why I think uh, being on top of the law, being on top of the legal news is probably more relevant now than at any time in my life, quite frankly. We've got all of the criminal justice reform movements. We've got this war that's brewing between the cops and Antifa and BLM and you know the other factions and the protesters. And so there is a lot to talk about right now. And we want to we want to be part of providing value, be part of, you know, talking about solutions, adding to the conversation and helping to move the ball forward one way or another. All right. And, and, and Tacitus Kilgore says growing pains are to be expected. We don't mind. I appreciate that. Yeah. You know, uh, sometimes I get so stressed over this stuff, you know, it's like, ah, I'm screwing this up. I'm screwing it up. They're going to hate me, but I appreciate that. Really appreciate it. Um, from Zulu. Hey Rob. Hey Zulu. If someone shot a teenage vigilante, vigilante who was shooting people in self-defense, could shooting the kid in turn be considered self-defense? It's a great question. So, so the, the, the best I can do is sort of give you an analogy. Um, so, so think back to the Breonna Taylor case, Zulu on this one. So it's, it's all, it's all about context. So if we're talking about Rittenhouse, I, I don't think that they could let, let both sides would make the argument, right? Both sides would make the argument and then it would be up to the jury to sort of decide. But like, like, for example, let's back up to the Breonna Taylor case. So with Breonna Taylor, we had the cop who ran through the door. We had uh, Mattingly and Cosgrove. They went through the door. Kenneth Walker was in his home and he shot. Remember, the police arrested him originally. When the police went into his home at that point in time, they said, we have self-defense. Kenneth Walker said, no, 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 I have self-defense. So you have all these multiple parties claiming self-defense. Kenneth Walker then is in his home. So he has the presumption of self-defense. He has, he, he gets those rights. He said, I'm in my home. You came into my home. I didn't go into your home. So he gets the presumption. Now, if you remember the cops charged him, but then they turned around and dismissed it because he was right. He had that presumption of self-defense. And because he was in his home, he had those facts that weighed in his favor. But in some other instances, the self-defense thing is what's called an affirmative defense. So you can say, so Kyle could say, yes, I shot that person. I killed that person, but I was doing it out of self-defense. So you're saying, yep, yep, it wasn't, which is, which is exactly what happened in Rittenhouse's case. You could say, yep, he shot all those people, acknowledged it. Don't even have to argue about that. I had a gun. I pulled the trigger. I hit him multiple times. They're not with us anymore. As a result, now uh, 
you know, I'm not even going to challenge that there was an intentional killing. I intended to kill that person and I did it, but I did it because of self-defense. And then it's up to Kyle or whoever's on that side of the argument to invoke affirmatively to say, this is why self-defense applies and then go through and make your case. And then that's up to the jury to decide whether that affirmative defense applies or not. So you have multiple sides making that argument. And then whoever has the better facts, the better arguments will win. Toy Airy, this channel is pretty dang good. And I'm very impressed with this live show, a couple suggestions: have mods keep them out of the spotlight, but but they're to moderate, not greet and chat. Yeah, we're trying to figure that out. Thanks, Toy, for that suggestion. Uh, Faith's over there, probably soaking this in. Um, Dems want infinite mail-in ba ballots counted perpetually after November third until they can manufacture a Biden win. What are your thoughts on jury nullification? That comes from Mark Carpenter. So, you know, this is one of those things that you're not supposed to talk about as a lawyer not supposed to say anything about jury nullification. But, you know, if you don't like the law, if you don't like somebody who's sitting in front of you, you don't like what was presented in front of you, you don't think that the government met their burden, I think that a juror should do whatever a juror needs to do at that moment in time. If a juror listens to the charges and says this is nonsense charges, you don't have to convict people for things. That's what a jury exists for. And the courts and the prosecutors have done this, this con job in a lot of ways to make sure that the jury doesn't know that they can nullify these things. They really want to sort of skate around this. So if I'm in a trial, you know, I can't talk about jury nullification. I can't do any of that stuff because I get slapped on the wrist big time. But if more people talk about it, more people go into court and say, look, you know, I, you don't have to play the game of the government just because you're part of it. Doesn't mean you have to sit there and take everything that the prosecutor says for granted and believe them. You don't have to believe the cops. You don't have to believe any of them. And if you say, I, I find zero credibility, with any, any of the evidence I presented, you can say, I just don't buy it, and I'm going to vote to acquit. And that's it. From Ma the Fox, many people don't realize brandishing your firearm is very close to the same idea as shooting your person at someone, shooting your weapon at someone. Do you think more people should be aware of the laws around rights? I really do. I really do. I think, I think that's a great, a great point. People don't realize just how serious it is to point a gun at somebody. People think that you have to shoot them or something like that. It is a very serious charge just to even point a gun at somebody. And I do think more people should know about that. Uh, I have my concealed carry permit. I would, you know, I, would, I would really recommend that anybody who's interested in firearms or is around firearms to go get that because you learn a lot about the laws. And it's important that you do because people, uh, people can get into, into serious legal trouble quickly for stuff that you or I may think is minor. The law looks at it very, very seriously. Jar Jar Binks again, can you force a trial by jury if you think the legal system is not giving you a fair shake or can a judge override or go 13 juror if the case isn't to their liking? It's a great question. Great question. Um, so here's, here's it's, it's a complicated question, but there's, there is what's called a judgment notwithstanding the verdict. So a judge has the ability to take some of the verdict back from the jury under certain conditions. So if the judge uh, thought that the jury came to a, like an impossible conclusion, like there's no way that a jury could have uh, convicted somebody on that, the judge can take it back. Or if there's some sort of malfeasance or misconduct that takes place with the jury, um, that's, you know, that's a separate thing. Uh, so, so there are some instances when that can happen, but it's not common. And, and it can't be something like the judge just didn't like the verdict. There needs to be some sort of uh, major problem with the case. And the, the judge also you know, there are certain there are certain requirements as to whether you get a jury trial or not. So in Arizona, uh, you know, basically you have to be going to jail before they'll give you a jury trial. So if you just had you know a simple you know criminal damage charge or something like that, they they probably would not even give you a jury. They would just say, nope, we're not asking for jail. It's just a misdemeanor fine. So it's going to be a bench trial in front of a judge. You don't even get a jury. It has to be something like in Arizona a DUI where you get jail time where they'll give you by constitution, a jury. All right. What's your opinion of Legal Eagle? Another lawyer, YouTuber, if you don't know. That's from Spare Time 24-7. I do know of Legal Eagle. Um, I, I don't... I have a little bit of an opinion on him. Uh, part, of, part of my opinion stems from this idea that he kind of talks a lot about everything, uh, all sorts of all the different laws. He very articulate guy, very nice looking channel, obviously got, you know, a channel about 
50 times the size of this channel. So he knows what he's doing. He's doing a great job on it with his channel. But anytime I see a lawyer who talks about like a little bit about everything, to me, that's a little bit of a cause for concern. Here's why we say that. So when you're actually practicing law and you want to be very good at one area of law, in my opinion, it's best to focus on that one area. So for example, our firm, we only do criminal law. That's it. If you came into our office and you said, hey, I've got this tax problem, or I want to file bankruptcy, or I want to get a divorce, or I want to file, a, start a corporation, form an LLC, we would say, that's great. Congratulations. You're getting divorced. You're starting an LLC and whatever. That's not our firm. You have to go find somebody else who does those things because we only do criminal law here. We want to be very good at criminal law. We want to do an excellent job. We want to know everything there is to know about the science and DUIs and you know how, how all of the different statutes work and how the technology works and all of those things. And when you're somebody who talks about everything, it means that you're kind of just surface level across a lot of those things in general. And I'm speaking generally, I don't know legal, legal or anything about them, but if that is you know, if that's sort of his approach to practicing law, it's, I think it's great for YouTube, but it's not so good offline. We call it door law. When we're talking about other attorneys, it's that lawyer who will take literally anything who comes through their door. So a lot of new lawyers will do this. They'll graduate law school. They'll start a company. They'll hang a shingle and they'll take anything. You, you get in a car accident. I got it. Uh, you slip and fall. I'll take that. You got charged with the DUI. No problem. Getting a divorce not an issue. They take everything that comes through because they just need the money. They just need to talk about stuff. To me, that's a little bit what legal Eagle feels like. He's really good at, at sort of trend jacking, taking, you know, what's popular and what's going to be viewed and making a surface level video about that. The last thing I saw from him was this thing on Trump's taxes. I was kind of scrolling through it. And I'm like, is this guy a tax lawyer? Does this guy ever run a business before? Does he know about how these laws work and how depreciation works? Does he have a company? Has he ever had employees? Does he own any real estate? Does he own any property? Because it didn't make much sense to me. Now, it was very good if you're anti-Trump and you want to believe in Trump Trump, you know, having all these tax problems and things. And his video probably rang the bell for those people. Uh, but in terms of, you know, substantive lawyering on the ground, in the trenches, in court, all those types of things, I don't think that's the type of lawyer he is. He's, a, he's a, probably a very good YouTuber. And I'm sure he's got some experience in certain areas of law. But uh, those are my thoughts. Don't have anything bad to say about the guy, but we're just, we're, we're different. We're different uh, people, I would say. Okay, we, we do criminal law. That's it. We're on the ground. We got a team of attorneys every day in court. He's doing something different. All right. Well, listen, everybody, it's about, it's about that time. I want to thank you so much for being here. Um, last comment, Viva Frey, Robert Barnes, big fan of those, both those guys, uh, follow both of them, watch them regularly and enjoy their content. I think those guys are a little bit more you know, opposite there. They, Robert Barnes in particular, he does some deep dives and he does, he does, uh, some very good analysis. So we'll leave it there. Want to thank everybody for being here, being a part of the program. If you can hit the subscribe button, if you have not already done so. And if you remember, just share the video with your friends. Say, Hey, this is a cool spot to be at 4 PM. We will be here tomorrow at 4 PM. Little show note, by the way, I will not, uh, I know I will not be here on Thursday or Friday. I have an actual in-person conference that is taking place. It's going to be great. I'm excited to get out there and see some people. So I'll be in a conference Thursday and Friday. So no show on those days, but I will be back here Tuesday and Wednesday for watching the watchers live. So we'll see you then. Thank you so much for being here. Have a wonderful